Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending where you're joining us from. It's a pleasure to have you all here. And I see that uh, people have joined us from all over the world. Um, we're delighted to have you here. This is the ninth event in our publishing critical work PDW series. This series is part of a larger aim to connect, support, and nurture critical work um, and support the CMS community. Today, we have with us the editorial team of the journal Culture and Organization. So we're joined by Scott, Ilaria, Gossia, Tyron, and Kristen. A very warm welcome to all of you. Culture and organization has been uh, sort of a champion when it comes to research and work in culture and organizations. And uh, it, it, it publishes work which draws from a variety of uh, paradigms in humanities, social sciences, philosophy, and performing arts. So I'm very excited about this uh, webinar. Um, now, before I hand over to the panelists, a few housekeeping rules. Uh, so I would request all the attendees to please post your question in the Q&A button. And this button should be at the top, uh, at the bottom of your screens. Uh, so don't put your questions in the chat box. Please uh, use the Q&A button. And the CMS in Touch team will make sure that these questions go to our panelists. And uh, feel free to put your questions at any time during the webinar. The plan is that we are going to listen to the uh, editorial team, and then we will have the discussion where we look at the questions that have been posted by you all. Um, also, uh, the CMS in Touch team, we're on Twitter. So if you want to uh, uh, create a storm on the Twitterverse, please uh, go ahead and do that. Uh, tweet about this PDW. Just don't forget to tag the uh, CMS in Touch. That's our uh, handle. So I'm going to stop now and I will hand over to our panelists. Uh, so over to you. I think uh, Scott's uh, taking it from here. That's so right, thanks. yeah. Thank you, over to you, Scott. Thanks very much. So um, actually, if we can go to the first slide, I'll, uh, I'll begin from there because that's got, I think, a picture of the editorial team and I can uh, introduce everybody who's there. Um, yeah, so if we could go to the next slide, please. Yeah. OK, so um, I'm Scott Lawley. I'm one of the editors of Culture and Organization, uh, alongside Thomas uh, Lenniforce, who's um, not here uh, today. And you can see we have um, a team of ed associate editors as well. Uh, and from that team, I'm joined by uh, Ilaria Boncori. Um, I'm joined by uh, Gosha Chizelska. I'm joined by Tyron Love. And I'm joined by Kristen uh, Williams. Um, so we've got four out of our team of six uh, associate editors with, with us, and they will be speaking as we go through the session uh, today. So if we could go on to the next slide, please. OK, so uh, I wanted to sort of talk about um, the origins, I guess, of, of culture and organisation. So we were, we're having a chat um, just the other day amongst um, those of us that are presenting and thinking how we can put across what culture and organization uh, is about and the sort of the ethos and the sort of the type of work uh, that, that we do. And when we were speaking, we were sort of thinking, well, we can't really separate that from uh, SCOS, which is, um, you know, culture and organization is essentially the house journal of uh, SCOS, which is the standing conference on organizational symbolism. And um, Many of you will know it for its uh, annual conference, and it's a, a community of uh, scholars broadly based in the sort of organization studies area, but with, I guess, a, you know, a very sort of left field um, uh, approach to that, to that topic. So it's quite an experimental um, community as well. And certainly if I, if I speak from my own background, the first time I went to a SCOS was, um, 2002 um, in, in Budapest, so it's been almost uh, 20 years that I've been involved. And I realized when I turned up there that that really was the sort of the space for me. It was incredibly welcoming. There was such a, a broad pluralistic um, uh, approach to the, to the topic area. Uh, and certainly, you know, you, you hear many people say Scots, they found their, their home in that. So um, the conference takes place every year, and the link with culture and organization, uh, there are many links. Um, one of them is that the chair of SCOS will then, after they finish that term, 
uh, generally move over to culture and organization and do uh, a three year term as editor there. Um, that's not exclusively other people do come on board as editor like, uh, like myself, um, but there is that strong link between uh, the two. Uh, and also whenever a conference takes place, there's a special issue of SCOS based on that. And we'll talk about some of the content of that. So authors, reviewers do come from the uh, SCOS community, but also from beyond that as well. Um, and in terms of the evolution of culture and organization as the, uh, the journal of, of SCOS, um, back in the day, there was a, a, um, an, a, a a, a journal called Dragon, which was the, the House Journal of SCOS. And then that uh, became Studies in Cultures, Organisations and Societies. So if you do actually look um, online at the back issues, you'll see the first seven or so years have that name. And then the journal became Culture and Organisation. So it's that sort of broad intersection of culture, organisation and society. Um, that the journal operates within. Uh, so if we could go on to the next slide, please. Um, so yeah, just continuing with that link a little bit, um, these are some of the um, special issues. So th these have been conference themes um, from, from SCOS. Um, and, um, they've then gone on to be special issues uh, that we've invited papers around. We do also have other special issues that aren't necessarily uh, connected to conferences as well. I just thought I'd put that there to give um, an overview of just some of the topics that um, have been covered in those special issues. And then I'm gonna pick out a couple of them um, that either myself um, or Ilaria, who's here, have, have guest edited. Just really want to give you a flavor of the sort of types of paper that we publish within the, the journal and, and how these themes can be interpreted in different ways. So uh, yeah, if we go on to the next slide. Thank you, that's um, from um, Rome in 2017, where the theme was carne, flesh and organization. Uh, and Ilaria, who is now one of our associate editors, who's here today, um, would would well, was one of the also the um, conference organisers and also then a, a, an editor of the special issue. So Ilaria, if you're there, do you want to just talk us through some of the papers that were in that special issue? Sure, thank you. Um, yes, we organised this conference in my hometown, which is Rome in Italy. Um, and the topic was carne, flesh and the organization. So we really were looking for contributions that were um, about the embodied experiences of organizations, about um, kind of like affective sensorial experiences of organizations and those aspects that are very often considered more individual or private and not really uh, discussed much in, in, in many mainstream publications. So you will see that um, I won't go through all of them. For example, uh, Sersha has a beautiful paper on the experience of non-binary and trans people in organizations and how um, the, those experiences are marginalized or neglected or silenced. Um, we also had uh, Brigitte and Christina writing uh, a great paper on kind of like this embodied dance uh, in organization choreography. Um, so we also looked um, with Norton Dide at this uh, great way of thinking and understanding organizations through poetic inquiry. And the focus of that was on uh, fat female employees and, and, and the stigma of, of being, um, uh, well, overweight or underweight. So um, those are really, really interesting original contributions that fit perfectly um, with our uh, special edition. We actually had other additional papers um, that were like Suvi, um, Suvi's paper, uh, Astrid's paper on birthing experiences that didn't um, fit within the, the special issue for, for uh, kind of space purposes we, we thought were great and so we um published us as part of the of the general um journal issues 
Thank you, Ilaria. And then um, if we could go on to the next um, slide. So this was um, the conference that was in Nottingham where I'm sat right now uh, in 2015, which was uh, the theme was home. Um, and then, yeah, two years later, that comes out as the, the special issue in the journal. And again, these were the uh, papers that we published in that particular uh, issue. And again, hopefully it, it just gives um, uh, a, an idea of some of the areas that we, we cover. So um, Elizabeth Wilhoyt's paper, My Drive is My Sacred Time, is very much in that sort of um, spatial turn in organisation studies, looking at the liminal space of, of commuting. Um, and then Guru Corsens Christensen was talking about um, uh, domestic labour. So when people are bringing paid help within, um, within the home um, and, and that sort of blurring of the, the home and the, the, the workspace. Uh, and then Patricia McCarroll um, did a paper on facilities management where she actually uh, sort of drew a diagram of um, a, a house as a metaphor for the different rooms that represented the identity of a very sort of you know, marginal precarious um, profession. Uh, and Gabriella Whitehead's piece um, on um, expats um, uh, used um, archetypes from mythology um, as a sort of a typology of, of different ways in which professionals viewed their situation as transnational uh, expats. So we got four very different um, takes on uh, that particular theme um, within, within that special issue. If we could go on to the next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, and yeah, just uh, I, I've put a list there of uh, a number of other papers. So, of course, we don't only do special issues, but there are um, the open issues as well. Um, and I was going to sort of go through the archives to, to get some papers to give a, a feel for, for what's there. But actually, I only had to look at things that we've published quite recently in, in the past year. Um, just to sort of give a flavour of some of the types of paper um, that, that we do publish. So um, the, the, the one at the top of the list, um, The Power of Daydreaming, that is actually one of the online first articles. So it's the most recent paper um, that, that we've um, accepted, The Power of Daydreaming, um, very much based around the, the, an interview and the, the experiences of, of um, a, a farmer um in, in in sweden um and the finding viola paper um uh, from Kristen, who's actually with us today um is about um you know, the sort of the, the people who've been marginalized the hidden um voices in the history of organization studies which is certainly an area we, we're keen to look at um in in the, in the future um again another one from elizabeth wilhoyt larson uh, again, we have that sort of spatiality, um, spatial turn approach that we can see there. Um, we're getting an increasing number of, of papers taking a post-colonial perspective. And again, you'll see later on how that feeds into the types of papers we'd like to encourage. Um, and then the paper at the foot of that list on the video game as agencement, um, very much drawing on a, a, a Deleuzean uh, perspective, which again is uh, something, an area that we tend to find quite a few papers coming through as well. And then that cannot give you a full overview of, of published, but hopefully gives a flavour of the type of work uh, that appears within the journal. And then I think I'm doing the next slide as well. If we could go to that one, please. So this is our um, aims and uh, a scope of the paper. Um, so yeah, as I said earlier, it was founded as studies in cultures, organizations uh, and, and societies. Um, and we do have this um, focus on ethnographic, critical and interpretive uh, approaches. So 
some of the papers that, that we reject that come in are, are papers that are prim primarily um, quantitative papers or are outside of our sort of area of focus. Um, we are grounded in organization studies, um, but quite pluralis pluralistic in that. So looking at interfaces with things like media, cultural studies, uh, many other areas uh, as well. Um, yeah, if we could go on to the next slide. So I'm going to hand over to Kristin, who's going to talk a bit more about the approach of the journal. Hi there. Um, so very happy to be with you today. Um, as Scott has indicated, our approach uh, is is a, is a little bit more playful, perhaps, than you see in other journals. We're we're really looking for work that is distinctly critical, um, interdisciplinary. We take a very inclusive approach to uh, the kinds of, of writing that comes to us and the experience that we like to give to our authors, um, very developmental, very caring, um, very thoughtful in terms of, of the essence of the work. Um, but I think what really catches our attention is when people take novel approaches. Um, they're creative and innovative. Maybe they're exploring with writing differently or novel methods that we haven't seen in, in organizational studies before, or they bring us an organizational context that hasn't really been um, looked at before or contains organizational actors that, that are marginalized. So I think it's really important that it, it, we are anchored in the context of organizations, but it, there's a lot of ways that, um, that that definition of organization is very broad. Um, and in terms of, of the actual uh, interaction that, that you'll have with our team, if you go to the next slide, I'll describe the steps and we'll describe how we go, go through that. It's, it's not unusual. It's similar to what you would experience at other journals. You would, you know, hopefully when you would uh, look to our journal, you would consider the objects and the aims and scopes first to make sure that you feel that your paper is a strong fit um, with our journal. Once it's submitted, it, it goes to our secretary and it's actually assigned to um, either an, our editor or one of the associate editors, at which time, um, let's say the paper came to me as an associate editor, I have the opportunity then to make a decision as to whether or not I do believe it's a fit for the journal um, or not, in which case I could reject it um, at the desk or send it on to reviewers. I would say that it, it's not, um, <laughs> it can't be understated how much we really appreciate our reviewers and go beyond and above to find the very best reviewers for your work. We're really interested in making sure that they're a match for the subject matter and the way that you've approached your subject and the way that you approach your paper. Um, I had a, uh, and, and reviewers are worth their weight in gold, and we know that not a lot of people have time these days. So sometimes it can take us a little bit of time to find the right reviewers, and um, we might go through th several people before we actually come up with the team that's, that's going to be attached to your paper. So um, just want to give you a little bit of back of, back of house on that, because it can be it can be challenging for us as associate editors, particularly in this day and age, to find reviewers with time and capacity and, and the right expertise to tackle your paper. Obviously, then your paper is going to go through the, the typical process of, of um, you know, editorial revision, et cetera. Um, and we, we ask that you really do listen to those reviewers. We, we have carefully selected them because we believe that they're experts in your field and, and can offer you really developmental feedback. Um, you might then be asked to make major and then minor um, revisions. It's not unusual to receive a paper back with major revisions at the onset if you've been accepted and sent on to review. Um, and we'll, that process will continue until we feel that, that we have a paper that can be um, pushed forward for acceptance. And, and then you'll go through the typical process of reviewing proofs and formatting and copyright, et cetera, before the, uh, the paper comes out for early sight and then is ultimately assigned to a volume and an issue. Um, so I think what distinguishes us from other journals is, is the very caring approach we take to back of housework on the review side. Um, I know that many of us have talked a lot about how we communicate to our authors, how we communicate to our reviewers, um, for us, it's not a mechanical transactional experience. It's it's um, it's a it's a personal one. We're very we're very attached to your success, and we're very interested in the work of the journal. 
um, and and we really are interested in you being successful with your paper. So next slide, please. That's me. Um, hello, everyone. Um, just just to follow up on what uh, Christine was saying, um, we we really have that very much you know developmental approach, um, and the reviewers we pick, um, and many of them are from SCOS community, uh, but not always. Uh, we really want to help you to develop the paper. So uh, when we get the paper and we see the potential. Um, we really want you to engage uh, with our comments and with comments from the reviewers to to make it better, make it publishable. Um, so you know, it's it's about kind of not telling you what's wrong or, or you know how much we would like to write a different paper based on on the topic that you choose. And you get some of those from other journals. So we're not doing that. We we rather try to take your approach as given and. And point you towards some, you know, changes that would make us make it better from from our point of view. We we always acknowledge the strengths of the paper, um, and we, we try to really give you, you know, further further resources and suggestions. Um, it's not always easy to uh, to reject a paper, and sometimes we we do reject papers, desk reject. Um, but these are usually those who don't fit our aims and objectives, those who are within the scope we, we really try to be helpful um, and offer and offer our our support. Um, can I have next slide, please? So if, if we look at the, the most common features of accepted papers, it's as, as I mentioned that the first thing is to meet our aims and, and scope. Um, and it's really important that you engage with culture and organization as, as a field. Um, it's not good to send this paper which is just about the culture and especially culture in a very normative uh, term. So, so if you think about Hof, the type of framework, this is not what we're interested in. We might be interested in critique of that framework, but not uh, the framework itself. Uh, we want you to engage with uh, current uh, conversations in the journal. So it's, it's like with any other journal, you, you really need to um, browse what's been published so far in the area uh, that is close to, to your themes uh, and try to, you know, in a way reference that. Uh, but it, it's about joining the conversation within the journal. Uh, uh, and also that gives you indication that the certainty theme is, is, is of our interest. Um, we accept uh, papers for general submissions or, or special issues. Um, and I think special issue calls are in a way easier to write uh, for because they're more specific and uh, it gives you a little bit more guidance of what the special issue editor expect from, from the selection of themes or, or particular methods. Uh, but, but we also um, have a lot of um, papers submitted for general submissions. Um, when you look at your paper, please use your closed networks to have it reviewed before submitting to us to make sure they are well written, the language is clear and they are well structured. These are easy things to spot. Uh, usually by, by somebody who didn't write the paper and, and can review it for you. And it makes it much easier on us as, as associate editors. Uh, and also it makes it easier for us to find reviewers who, who think that, you know, it's not a massive work to, to comment on a paper that perhaps needs a lot of tidying and a, a lot of revision to the content. Um, and as we mentioned, we are very much of a qualitative and critical journal. So, so these the papers accepted will be within, within that area. Thank you. Can I have next slide, please? Sorry. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so if you're interested in, in publishing, please send us um, ideas or papers. And if you're interested in reviewing, you can get in touch with any of us um to to take this forward but we also wanted to give you an idea of the reasons why sometimes papers are not 
accepted or even desk rejected. So the, the, the first two points, uh, unsuitable and unsound, are the two main criteria. So unsuitable means that it doesn't fit with our aim and scope. And the vast majority of papers we reject are due to this reason. Um, unsound means that the paper is either severely underdeveloped or um, the methodology needs more work, the methods have not been presented in a rigorous way for empirical contributions, or those contributions are not uh, clear. So um, what um, Gossia just said is that it's really important that you engage with the, the topics, uh, the papers, the conversations in our journals, not for um, just kind of like referencing purposes, but just to continue on that conversation to contribute to our community through discussion. Um, it's also really important to, um, to think of what the connection is to organization and more broadly organizing. And we are very interdisciplinary, so we really um, welcome papers from all sorts of, you know, social sciences and humanities, all different subjects and fields, but it is important that the link to organization organizing is, is clear and explicit. Um, so we are looking at nuances and we're looking at explorations of different phenomena that are not uh, limiting and normative. So um, we, we try to um, encourage uh, from the very start our authors to be quite analytical and critical rather than simply descriptive. Um, one of the other reasons where we, we often um, uh, reject a paper is that the paper is very descriptive or purely quantitative without any critical engagement. Next slide, please. Thank you. So we wanted to give you an idea in terms of metrics for those of you who are interested. Um, you will find more information on metrics, impact and so on on our website. Um, but we just wanted to give you an idea of kind of like the top line metrics there at the top in terms of annual downloads. We have had 59,000 downloads this past year. Um, and you can see our impact factors and the scope of site score has gone to 2.1. We wanted to show you again, just kind of like uh, exemplars of what our um, community is interested in. And so you will see that the top downloaded article is learning empathy through literature, um, which has had 3,006 downloads. And we also are very engaged online. So please feel free uh, to follow us on social media, either the editors or um, culture and organization on Facebook. Um, and you will see that this paper on incentivizing resilient supply chain design um, has received uh, an alt metric score of 177. And as you might know, the alt metric score is about the number of times that um, this paper was uh, mentioned on social media. So it's about social media uh, attention. Um, here you have just a list again of articles. Um, some are open access, others are not, but just articles that um, have been downloaded the most uh, over the past um, few years. Um, and this is just to give you an idea of particularly what our audience finds interesting. Next. Is Tyron with us? I can take that for, for Tyron. Um, Thank you. So what I think we really wanted to emphasize as well for uh, the audience is, is what we're looking for, uh, what we would love to see in our journal and some of the um, things that we hope that you will consider taking on. I think one of the unique features about our journal is that special issues provide a really interesting way to curate a conversation around a particular idea. And I find that they're very successful at culture and organization. And um, so if you're interested in approaching us about a special issue, please do so. We have two active um, special issues right now, one that Alaria and her colleagues are leading on embodied writing, 
and another that's called Flexible Lives, Spatial, Temporal, and Behavioral Boundaries in a Fluid World of Work and Home. So um, very interesting opportunities to make contributions to those existing special issues, but also wanted to encourage you to um, consider a special issue of your own. I'm in the middle of developing one myself on um, a group with a group of, of folks that I led a PDW with at AOM on collective autoethnography. And if you're interested in that, feel free to get in touch with me. Um, but I hope to see that one out there shortly and, and as a call. In terms of the kinds of um, topics or uh, ways of seeing, ways of knowing that we are really interested in, probably should come as no surprise that we're very interested in embodied and sensorial experiences. We would love to have more Indigenous perspectives on organizing within, within the journal and conversations on decolonizing and the struggles to decolonize. Um, we love innovative methods, particularly if they haven't been um, well, you know, well utilized within the organizational space. And there's a lot of opportunity to look what's happened elsewhere in social sciences and humanities in, and uh, introduce those methods to, to organizational studies. Um, we, we firmly support uh, feminist approaches, particularly the tradition of writing differently and in writing different styles um, and emphasizing the voices that have been marginalized um, within, uh, within organizations. Um, and, and again, those intersections with culture, arts, et cetera. Um, I think one of the things that, that um, we as a journal are particularly sensitive to is how do we invite um, contributions from all different parts of the world? Uh, so not just different uh, lenses and voices, but, but different, you know, baked into the earth of, the, of uh, from different parts of the world. So very interested in, in different perspectives um, and would like to, uh, you know, invite you to consider making contributions in those ways. Next slide, please. So again, um, now that you've heard a little bit about what we're doing and what we're looking for, we are always looking for reviewers. I've already seen a question um, from Ruth Slater. Thank you. Of course, we'd love to have you as a reviewer, Ruth. Um, get in touch with me. Ruth is actually going to help me with that special issue on collective autoethnography. Um, certainly consider getting involved in our conference. It is such a great conference with such great conversations. Um, and if you haven't been before, uh, it's just a breath of fresh air. Um, and please consider special issues. Please consider um, submitting a paper. We would love to have you involved in culture and organization. I think that might be it. I'm not sure if there's a next slide or not. Actually, could I, actually, I was just going to add something if I can oh, about please. the <laughs> workshops. Yeah. <laughs> can, can we just go back to the last slide? Um, thanks. Um, so the, the, it says that you can consider hosting a future SCOS conference. Well, that, that, I mean, that is a massive undertaking, but I know um, SCOS would be absolutely um, grateful of people who are interested in, in running the, the conference. But if you didn't want to go as far as that, then SCOS do have a, a special events fund. Um, and that is for organizing some form of uh, a workshop. Um, and generally that is tied to a special issue. So the workshop is very much a developmental um, uh, environment that um, people can talk about and, and um, get peer support on papers that then could become part of a special issue. So you know, if you didn't want to go as far as a conference and if you've got a special issue in mind, then you could consider applying to that special to, uh, to, to run that uh, that workshop. Um, we've got um, a special issue that's going to come out um, at some point next year, quite early next year. Um, uh, uh, that's Anker Strauss and, and Monica Costera. It actually began as a workshop. Um, Sadly, it couldn't take place due to COVID. It couldn't take place certainly in person, but um, we've now got a really promising uh, special issue that is, is coming from that. Um, so if you do have you know, ideas for anything you would like to do as a special issue, again, please do get in touch with us and, and we'll be more than pleased to hear about that. Uh, can we go to the next slide, please? 
so the, just a few addresses there. That's um, our website, um, the editorial office, and our Facebook page. And I've also put the SCOS website there because you can find out about the conference and the special events fund uh, from there. And I think that is the last of the slides that concludes our presentation. Um, so we can move on to look at some of the questions. Um, and I can see we have a question from Mark. Um, basically said, I'd, I'd like to use fiction in my research, both methodologically and as a form of writing differently. Um, how receptive are culture and organization to this form of academic paper? So using ficto criticism, for example. Um, and the answer to that is, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um, um, so one of the papers I mentioned from the special issue earlier, uh, which is the one that I um, uh, edited, co-edited um, based on the conference that I organized in Nottingham. Uh, we had the one paper that used um, uh, used mythology um, and used some of the archetypal characters in mythology as a form of analysis um, uh, for uh, character for people for their experiences as expatriate workers. Um, so that would be just one example that, for me, uh, comes to mind. Um, Ilaria, I guess the writing differently aspect as well, the, the fiction yeah. Um, yeah. potentially fit into, into the special issue that you're looking at as well. Yes, we've been having meetings with colleagues um, looking at submitting for the special issue on embodied writing, which is due in March 2022. And a lot of different methodologies or approaches, for example, uh, poetic inquiry has been, um, has been something that's been uh, considered, but also uh, performative dialogue. Um, so I think, you know, there is the, these are all very uh, interesting and very welcome approaches. Um, yeah, thanks. Did anyone else uh, want to say anything about that? Or I can move on to the next question. Um, I think this is this one, um, Kristen, I think this is aimed for the collective autoethnography. Um, special issue that's in development at the moment um mm -hmm. so yeah saying thank you for a helpful session i'm interested in exploring more about the collective autoethnography special edition please okay so i can i'm i'll type my email in there so that you can get in touch with me amal um and to mark the paper that i published earlier last year on Viola actually includes um, fictal criticism. So if you're interested in, in picking up on that and, and how it's presented in the journal, you're, you're gonna find lots of lots of incidences of it. So, but yeah, the, the essay on collective autoethnography, um, we have a team for the, the uh, editorial group. I just haven't written the SI yet, but it is, it is embedded in the tradition of writing differently. And the idea that, that we would, um, use our autoethnographic reflections potentially to help build each other's work. So it's about writing collectively. Um, and we were experimenting with that in a PDW situation. So um, that's, that's a little bit about how that SI is coming together. And I'd be happy to connect with you about that a little bit more. So thanks for your interest. Okay. Any other questions or comments? Are we at the end of the questions? Well, there's a question about how do you get uh, involved uh, with the editorial board, in the editorial board, in the editorial board. Um, so that there is a call usually once once a while um, on the journal page where you can apply for all sorts of roles that uh, are needed and there's a due process. Um, so just just keep keep an eye out on it. Um, look at the journal page often, 
there's lots of interesting things there, not just the <laughs> calls for editorial roles. Yeah. So, I mean, we, we recently um, did have some changes on the editorial uh, board. Um, so some people have been with us as um, associate editors um, left and um, we put out a call and from that we associated, appointed our most recent um, associate editors. So um, that's a process that uh, we'll go through periodically. Um, so, yeah. If you look out, um, it will happen again. Are there any other any other questions? So I've got a question here. Could you talk a bit more about how to respond to reviewers? That's a really good question, actually. Yeah. Um, so obviously, you you uh, be aware in the, in the review process when you uh, resubmit. Then um, uh, part of that resubmission process is to write a separate um, response to uh, the the reviewers. Um, I, I guess I'm, I'm actually sort of just reflecting on a, a, a recent experience of, of this where I saw a really good sort of almost like a dialogue um, during the process between the, the sort of the reviewer, um, the, the reviewers and the, um, the author. And you, you could really see um, you know, that, that sort of ongoing development of the paper almost through the dialogue that, that, that took place. Um, in terms of, uh, yeah, how you would uh, respond. So generally what will happen is uh, you will get the comments that are from um, two or the three reviewers that have looked at your paper and whichever editor is um, overseeing the paper will write something um, to uh, bring that together. And if you'd like to highlight some of the main points to address or to bring out some of the uh, common themes in the reviews and sometimes um, sometimes when you're editing actually um, you don't have to do much more than say please look at the reviews and, and follow what they say sometimes you'll find that, that there will be quite um, quite long reviews um, and as an editor I will bring out some of the common themes um, that will be across the reviewers um, to sort of help you a little bit um, in your revisions and your uh, response. Uh, and uh, it might sound obvious, but um, one of the first things in the response to the reviewers is to actually take note um, of those comments and the editorial uh, direction. In terms of the actual separate response that you write, um, I, I I guess I can sort of give examples of, of, of where this is done well and sometimes examples where it's not done so well. And, and sometimes people will respond and not really respond to the points that have been raised. So I think taking um, each of the points that is made and answering them in turn is a good way to do that response. So, um, Generally, I find the ones that are most straightforward for me is almost where someone has created a, a table um, or, you know, they've cut and pasted um, from the review and literally said how they've responded to each point in turn. Um, I, I, I think acknowledging from the reviewers where they've said things that are helpful and have helped you to develop the paper. Um, Certainly from the position of where I've been a reviewer, um, it is really nice to know your points have been taken on board and have actually helped with that process of, uh, of development. Also, if there's something that the reviewers suggest and you feel that you don't want to follow that, um, because you know, we're not telling you exactly how to write the paper, then please do sort of tackle that head on almost, you know, say why 
you've um, acknowledged the comments, but why you've actually decided um, on this occasion that that's not what you want to do. Um, and also I would say, just make sure you also do respond to any sort of editorial direction that's given uh, as well. So sometimes people will respond to the reviewers, but um, respond to the editorial points as well. Anyone else? If I may add to that, I think it's, it's so, the, that relationship with the reviewers is so important. And I think in some of my more experimental work, they have been really invaluable. And, you know, they have really encouraged me to do more of that type of work. Um, I think as Scott was saying, it's really important that authors address all the comments. Um, and by addressing, it doesn't necessarily mean agreeing with. And sometimes, you know, reviewers have different ideas of where the paper could go. And I think it's important, though, that one acknowledges the, the, the comments and then explains why, as you were saying. Um, and I think, you know, as much as as much clarity as possible um, in the presentation of the answers and then also of the of the paper uh, and how it's been revised. That's also really useful. Thank you. Um, I've got a question in chat and I'm trying to scroll to read it and it keeps going between one half and um, the next of it. So I've got something that says, so if we have time, it might be worth answering the following question as it's useful for people thinking of planning their publication strategy. Um, what are some of your ambitions for the journal in the next five years? I think that was all part of the same question, but just the way I'm scrolling it, it's um, appearing as two separate um, uh, areas. Um, I think in terms of the next five years, um, I, I think, um, one of the first things is that we have increased the number of issues uh, that we publish. So we've now gone to um, six um, editions uh, per year. Um, and I think we certainly, um, that gives us more sort of scope and more um, a volume for, for publishing. So it also allows more special issues um, to, uh, to come in. Um, and so certainly if we went back, I'm not going to ask it to go there, but um, if we went back to the slide where we outlined some of the areas that we'd like to explore, um, I think we'd like to do that through, you know, obviously people can submit to open um, editions of the journal, but we would also like to see a lot more special issues which um, take these um subjects on board and, and sort of promote them and invite papers in that particular area. Oh, there we go. Brilliant. Um, so, I mean, that's, that's by no means a um, exhaustive uh, list of areas. And, you know, if, if you have ideas for special issues, we'd certainly, uh, uh, but yeah, that, that would, um, cover some of the areas that we would like to um, use these extra issues that we've got to, uh, to publish. Um, so yeah, that's one of the areas where we would perhaps be in five years time. It's always a difficult question to answer because my term will be long finished in, in five years time. Um, but I just sort of think um, still developing that very distinctive voice that we have within the organization studies field. I know as a journal, it's not ranked as highly as some of the other journals in the field, but I think it has that very distinctive voice and that very distinctive contribution. And I think um, we'd always want to be the, uh, the outlet for that. Thank you for that question. Um, are there any other questions at all? Yeah, one of the nicest comments I ever heard about our journal is that when the issues come out, people read them cover to cover. They don't just look at the abstracts. They read all of the articles and, and they read them front to back. So if there's, I, I don't know if there's anything better than that. I don't really care about those other metrics. <laughs> That's the one that matters to me. 
Right, so uh, a huge thank you to the team. Thank you, Scott, Laria, Kristen, and Garcia. Um, it's uh, it's great that you you know shared with us what kind of analytical and critical work uh, will find a place in the journal. And also thank you for shedding light on the review uh, process. Uh, I especially liked um, the part about the relationship that we have uh, with reviewers and how important it is. I have struggled in the past in terms of responding to reviewers so that I found that to be very useful. Um, it's also great to know that uh, there is uh, the kind of pluralistic critical work uh, that um, will find it uh, will find a place at uh, at the journal so thank you uh, for sharing uh, these insights uh, with all of us um, now before we close uh, I would just like to draw everyone's attention to some of our forthcoming events so we have uh, our event in November date uh, to be communicated a bit later on. Uh, this would be publishing critical work in gender work and organization. And uh, then in January, our, uh, we are going to look at publishing critical work uh, in the Scandinavian Journal of uh, Management. So dates uh, will be communicated soon. Now do follow us on, on Twitter. So our uh, Twitter handle is CMS in touch, and this will help you keep up to date with announcements, informations about events and webinars that uh, we are uh, we're we are organizing. Uh, we also have, uh, we're on LinkedIn as well. Uh, so please uh, connect with us there. We have a YouTube channel where you will find uh, recordings of all our previous uh, webinars and workshops that have been done. Uh, this one will be uploaded there uh, very shortly as well. So please have a look at our YouTube channel. Now, if you have any ideas about workshops, webin webinars uh, that you would like to uh, uh, organize, then please get in touch with us uh, through our uh, email, which is cmswebinars at gmail.com. So once again, a huge thank you to our uh, panelists for uh, sharing these uh, insights uh, with all of us. Uh, thank you to all the attendees who have joined us uh, from all over the world and also to my fellow CMS in touch team. So this has been great, uh, an excellent exp learning experience personally for me. So thank you and uh, see you next time. Take care and be safe. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.